subsidies, 10 billion worth of nuclear, uh, 19 billion in terms of ethanol, clean coal, and other dubious new energy subsidies, 11 billion uh, in the form of agricultural subsidies for unsustainable agriculture, and um, we, uh, we also saw $24 billion worth of subsidies for environmentally harmful transportation projects and land and water use projects. And then finally, we proposed a carbon uh, tax, which would bring in roughly $75 billion in revenue. Now, you may say this is pie in the sky, um, and in some ways it is, because until we go after the, the uh, campaign finance laws, we're going to have a hard time undoing a lot of these subsidies at the federal level. Uh, much less taking on the, the oil, gas, and coal industries with a carbon tax. Um, however, what I want to point to is in the state of Maryland, and now in the state of Vermont, and soon in the state of Oregon, there is a new initiative uh, underfoot. It's called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Um, it is an attempt to begin to internalize the costs, not only of uh, environmentally damaging projects like fossil fuel projects, but the cost of income inequality, the cost of time spent in traffic, the cost of uh, crime, all of these costs that we just uh, don't think about, and yet uh, the cost of water pollution, the cost of air pollution, the cost of climate change. Maryland has now put in place, Governor O'Malley has put in place this new indicator, the Genuine Progress Indicator, which is an attempt to move beyond gross domestic product, because as we all know, you can fight more wars, you can uh, have more oil spills, you can have more cancer, and GDP will go up. Clearly, we've known since its inception, uh, in fact, Simon Kuznets, the, the, the man who actually created GDP, recognized from the outset that it was not a, uh, an indicator that should help shape uh, social policy, and yet it has, not only in the U.S., but globally. Well, Maryland and now Vermont have put in place this new indicator, the Genuine Progress Indicator, and Oregon is about to do the same. And um, we have a report, which you can also see up on our website, um, which looks at the cost of income inequality to the state of Maryland. And what we found um, was if we could return simply to uh, the levels of inequality that existed in 1968 in this country, in the state of Maryland, that Maryland would benefit with over $65 billion in economic benefits, which is more than double the state budget. Um, it would also uh, result in, uh, of course, it would, you would have to take on issues of uh, you know, tax policy, minimum wage, and so on. So one of the initiatives that we're going to be working on in the coming year, and I encourage uh, those of you who are concerned, as, as one of the speakers last night was concerned about the minimum wage, we're going to be working with um, uh, Raise Maryland, which is a group that is taking on the minimum wage issue in the state of Maryland, to present to the assembly, uh, Maryland assembly, uh, what we're calling a GPI note. You may be familiar with a fiscal note, which is usually um, a, a, uh, a calculation of the cost of legislation that um, oftentimes results in legislation being shot down. Well, what this GPI note will do will present the cost of not, change, not raising the minimum wage that all of society would be bearing. And it will be an opportunity for us to make clear that uh, Maryland can't wait to raise its minimum wage. It's the beginning of a process of making clear to the public um, all the costs that we're paying as a result of all of these uh, subsidies and other forms of um, uh, tax benefits and tax, uh, tax credits that all of us are paying the price for in one form or another. So I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Emily. What's GPI? Thank you. What's GPI? Sorry, GPI, Genuine Progress Indicator. I, I, sorry about the thanks for, yeah, and you can learn more about it um, on our website, which is genuineprogress.net. Um, we're also developing um, a new economy. I don't know if you all have seen this new video called The Story of Solutions that Annie Leonard has recently come out with. Um, one of the solutions that she profiles in her nine minute video, you should definitely check it out, it's wonderful is the, the Genuine Progress Indicator. We'll be doing a speaking tour with her in the state of Maryland, and we're going to be developing um, a grassroots uh, network in support of this 
initiative to thank move you. beyond that, gender. That means, thank you. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Just, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. The name of the video. The story of, story of solutions. Sorry, solutions. So now we've got a sense of what we could do, um, some, some of the examples of how, we, um, how America isn't broke, um, how the United States isn't broke, and how we could um, transition and move some of the money and tax the bads um, and support, uh, therefore we could continue supporting the, the benefits that we need, um, the earned benefits. Um, but now I want to transition this conversation a little bit into more the political side. Um, what this current um, debate in Congress means for the Republican Party and also what does that imply for the Democratic Party. Um, to do so will be um, Bob Orsog who will give us a, a five minute analysis of the entire political spectrum of uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, before I do that, let me uh, pay tribute. It's a delight to have Mark Raskin here, uh, who obviously uh, his genius started this place 50 years ago, and he was for me the uh, the mentor who uh, learned uh, almost everything that I know at his at his feet. So it's a delight to see him here. And something that you'll probably not hear very often: the person who provided guidance at the helm through the hard years of the. Carter years and the, the, uh, particularly the Reagan years is Peter Weiss as chairman of uh, IPS and who really played a remarkable role in those uh, turbulent times when IPS was sort of at the center of the, the hurricane. Uh, so it's a delight to see Peter here too. Uh, and one final word, uh, everybody hails Mark and Dick and appropriately so for their genius in starting the place. But John Cavana has now been a uh, director for two decades and he inherited an institute that was in really bad shape, and he has built it back to an extraordinary uh, hub of activity and ideas, and uh, his personality is such, and the way he operates is such, he's learned the trick that if you don't ask for credit, uh, you can get a lot more done, uh, but he deserves an enormous amount of credit for what he's built here. So I Amen. Pay, pay my tribute to him. So let me just say a few things uh, in general and then go to the question that I was asking. Uh, the U.S. is not broke. Uh, it is being looted. You have to be clear about that. Right? It's being looted in ways that uh, Miriam and Daphne have uh, de described uh, in terms of the special interests. But the people who rig the rules are making out like bandits. And the difference now is that the level of predation, the level of the looting is such that it can't be sustained and still build the middle class in America. And so we are headed to uh, a set of crises. Um, <clears throat> so coming out of this great, great recession for the first time in memory, the top uh, uh, few percentage of Americans have taken not just a disproportionate portion of the rewards of growth, they have taken all of the rewards of growth, and then some, with the rest of us flailing simply to, to stay afloat. So it's important to have that in your head when you think about what is a set of purely manufactured and contrived crises called the budget crisis. This is simply a political uh, contrivance that has no reality in terms of our uh, fiscal or budgetary reality. We don't have a debt crisis. We do not have rising deficits. The deficits have been coming down faster than they should, faster than any time since the demobilization at the end of World War II, uh, thereby hurting the recovery. We don't have out of control spending. Spending has been coming down and is too low, not too high. And it is simply obscene, frankly, that a liberal Democrat president would brag repeatedly that domestic spending on his watch is scheduled to come down to levels not seen since Eisenhower uh, in the early 1950s. This is an utterly wrong-headed use of the uh, bully pulpit for Americans, and it is the lesson that Americans are, are is absorbing. So, what we're listening, what we're witnessing is a battle about who pays the bill and who gets the benefits. Wall Street blew up the economy. Uh, that crisis that then took place uh, basically doubled the national debt in relationship to GDP. For elites, this is a threat. Uh, they might be asked to pay a few more taxes, and it is an opportunity. This is a time when they can use the crisis in pure shock doctrine fashion 
to ask Americans in the name of shared sacrifice to make uh, cuts in things that they would otherwise never allow them to touch, like Social Security or Medicare or education or the, the general set of things, particularly now food stamps for the Republican right and the entire regulatory uh, network, which doesn't cost much money, but uh, corporations obviously don't like. So we have this unending series of contrived uh, crises invented whole cloth to use this tension created by the Wall Street wilding in the crash to uh, try to force the costs onto us. Um, now, within this, we have warring factions among the elites. The Koch brother-funded uh, Tea Party Republicans uh, are the true zealots. They want to use this moment, obviously, to repeal uh, Obamacare, and they have uh, tried to create a situation in which uh, the, we will either threaten, the gov uh, threaten to uh, blow up the international financial system by defaulting on our debt, and we have closed the government uh, to, get, to force the president and the Congress and the American people to accept uh, either delaying or repealing Obamacare. Uh, they have finally blinked in this crisis, uh, and they are now uh, widely seen as having led Republicans into a ditch. Republicans are enjoying unprecedented high public disregard. Um, the Republican leadership, uh, admittedly an oxymoron, uh, has begun to seek a way out. But they only began to see that, seek that, it's important to note, after all the money operations, the Heritage Foundation Action Fund, the Prosperity, uh, American Prosperity Fund, the Koch Brothers Fund, uh, Club for Growth, all of them announced they would call off the dogs and allow Republicans to vote to reopen the government and lift the debt ceiling. It was only then that Boehner began to stir himself to try to figure out a way out. What they're looking for now is a graceful retreat instead of a rout. And the administration seems intent, for reasons that utterly escape me, <laughs> of snatching a defeat from the jaws of victory and putting us in a terrible, in a returned position, which is, Accepting a short-term hike in the debt ceiling, which is what's on the table now, so six weeks in some uh, discussions, six months in others, simply keeps the gun at your head. And it is in exchange for negotiating on what Republicans call pressing problems. The agreed subject of pressing problems is cuts in Social Security, Medicare, or the entitlement programs, as they're called, and tax reform that is deficit neutral. But tax reform, corporate tax reform, that's definitely neutral, what that translates into English is, we'll do tax reform for corporations that does not ask them to contribute one cent to deficit reduction, even as we call deficit reduction the crisis that's supposedly the most important thing America faces. So the Koch brothers' strategy has lost and it's been routed, but now P Peterson and his clack is taking over this debate. They have much greater uh, uh, reach in both parties in calling for shared sacrifice, and they th this discussion now becomes, in my view, more threatening than the one that the Koch brothers was run running because that was never going to happen. So what comes out of this? Let me talk a little bit about politics, which is the question I've started with, which is, uh, it is true that Repub Republicans are polling at a lower level than ever, ever in history. And so some think that this may give Democrats a chance to take back the House uh, in 2014, despite the uh, gerrymandered districts that means Democrats won the election House races for by a total of about 6 million votes in 2012 and still didn't win the House back. Uh, so a year is a very long time in politics, so this is premature at the very least. And if you think about the election in 2014, it's problematic. That is, in November 2014, this election will take place in the sixth year of a presidency with a lousy economy. We will still have mass unemployment. We will still have sinking uh, wages. We will still have uh, people feeling massively insecure. And uh, voters will be looking for someone to blame, sensibly. Uh, six years into a presidency, you tend to vote, that you tend to blame the party in power, also sensibly enough. Now, Republicans have done a good job, I think, of making themselves an unacceptable and avoid alternative, which is a good thing, but we still face that problem. Uh, one of the questions, I mean, one of the questions that uh, comes out of this is, 
what happens after the deal? There will be a deal, the government will open, the debt ceiling will be lifted. And there are two things that can be done. The president, with his bully pulpit and Democrats, can uh, talk about the damage that has been done in this process to the economy, which is, which is extensive and real. The damage that has been done with politics of austerity over the last year is forced by the Republican Party. And lay out a course of what we ought to be doing to get this economy to work for working people again and make it clear that Republicans are the ones standing in the way. Alternatively, they might do what the president has done in the past, which is take the deal, sell it as a success, try to present the economy as on the right track, and if we're just patient, we're creating jobs, we've got 47 months of job creation, 7.5 million jobs since the recession, yada, yada, uh, and try to sell the economy. And I assure you, I think that is the president's predilection for understandable psychological reasons, and it is a political, uh, it is the, the recipe for a political debacle. We tried that in 2010, um, and it didn't work. And if Democrats present themselves as the party of uh, the incumbents, proud of the work that they've done, headed into November of 2016, then it doesn't really matter how unpopular the Tea Party is. Uh, I would su suspect that the voters will be eager to uh, issue a spanking uh, about an economy that they don't. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay.